So yeah, my name is Paul de la Guilapla. I'm a research staff scientist at CIBM and a postdoc at uh, Biomedical Imaging Group here at the PFED. Uh, I pity that Alex actually went because uh, there are several points in the questions that will, will come up. Uh, I'll present a bit remote practical labs with personalized automated feedback. This to put you, well, I'll be presenting, but the work is, is not only mine. Uh, this is the core team. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Daniel Sash, who has been teaching for more than 20 years image processing programming. So he's the one with all the nice ideas on how to teach it. And then there's Alejandro and Kai, who are uh, excellent master students <laughs> that uh, did most of the heavy lifting on this project. Okay, uh, so a bit of context. Uh, this is within two courses, image processing one and two. Uh, that are given at DPFL by Michael Unger and Dimitri Van Deville. Uh, and they include a quite large array of topics in image processing. And uh, these are uh, rather abstract topics for, for some of the students. So it, it's perceived generally as a very mathematical course that is, is challenging to go through. Um, and even at the beginnings of these courses, it was realized that there would be need to be a practical counterpart because we needed to uh, teach to students of very different master programs with widely different backgrounds. And since this was a compulsory course for many of them, uh, and the numbers are quite a bit large, uh, the courses are successful. So there's like 200 and something uh, recurrently in IP1. Uh, so Daniel led this effort to develop uh, very good laboratories that really aid into uh, learning the concepts of the course and keeping in touch with the fact that image processing is a, a real thing that you do to images on your computer. Um, and there's this sentence I like to repeat, that the best way to understand an algorithm is obviously to code it and to test it. Um, yeah, so moving on then. Uh, we had this problem, which is a ton of students, uh, a need of uh, doing uh, practical laboratory work and a limited capacity of the rooms of the School of Engineering at EPFL. Uh, so this is a first problem. A second and much worse problem is the COVID pandemic, which rendered the typical use, uh, uh, the typical format of the labs impossible because basically you couldn't cram that many people in a room and at some point you couldn't even go. So we would have had to modify the course and remove the very appreciated practical component that it had. Um, so what we did instead was, ah, also it was very unsustainable. Uh, there, there was this discussion before about getting very good TAs. Okay, how do you get 18 of them? It's stretching the, the horse a little too much um, and to require them to be booked simultaneously for three hours across campus in several locations throughout the course is even crazy. Uh, so that's why we developed remote practical labs with personalized automated feedback. So each of those uh, terms that I highlighted uh, solves one problem, uh, one remote, there's no need, again, for rooms. Uh, the capacity of, of the EPFL computer rooms is no longer a problem. And then automated feedback. So how do we lift some of the work out of the TAs uh, and give the students feedback so that they learn on their own without having these crazy requirements? So for that, uh, we got two. Uh, of these wonderful fans of the digital resources for instructional learning. Uh, and as a result, we need no rooms now. Everything is remote. Uh, there's a little star because we still care a lot about the democratization of education. So uh, if there are students that need computers because they don't have the resources to do our labs from home or wherever, uh, then we provide access to the rooms, but that's mostly not the case. Uh, there's no need for manual grading, so TAs used to spend about a week to grade 200 copies of the same code, which is a job I wouldn't desire on my worst enemy. Uh, and then we now only need six TAs for two hours per session, which is a much more reasonable requirement. Uh, these are two hours that can happen in hybrid mode, through Zoom, or however uh, 
the current situation allows. Uh, we're still debugging exactly which is this number, this six. I used to say four. Now, uh, the practical realization of 200 people with questions make me update this number to six. We'll see, but it, it's not going to be 18. Okay. Um, okay. So, how to give personalized automated feedback? It, it looks like a contradiction, right? Because you want to give feedback that is specific to the student situation. Uh, but you don't want to do it yourself. Uh, so how do you do that? And I have this sentence, unit tests on steroids. So if you if you have programmed and if you have programmed unit tests, which are uh, small uh, scripts or functions that test whether other code is correct and it keeps providing the functionality you designed it to provide across the cycle and evolution of a software project. Then this, the type of programming you need to do to provide automated feedback to students so that they can learn without you being there is very, very similar. And it's excruciating because you have to think of many cases, but it's worth it. Okay, so we give two types of feedback. One type is summative feedback, so it's basically automated grading. They give a notebook and we give them a grade. And some feedback, of course, but... Uh, I think I'm not an expert on this, but the, the teaching theory tells you that that kind of feedback that you give next to the grade is not going to change the student's life much. Uh, they're going to maybe remember it, depends on the personality a bit, but it's not going to be the best path to make them learn something. Uh, we do this summative feedback using the ambigrader library. Uh, which is a library designed by other people, it's open source, and it basically provides this very easy way to have both the assignment, the solutions, and the hidden tests that put the grades in the same notebook. And then it handles all the complexity of generating release versions from there, importing submissions, and grading them. Not the file managing complexity that we had to do ourselves, uh, but more the, the logic of how to run things one after the other. Then the other type of feedback we give is uh, formative feedback, which I call it the holy grail here because it's basically what is shown to be most effective in making them learn something, which is there's a notebook that talks to the student and the student responds to the notebook. So while they're trying things, the notebook itself, it's telling them you're not going down the right path. And of course, there's no library for that. No one does that. That's one thing that we tried as a first. It's intrinsic to the notebook format. It happens by itself. Uh, but we went the extra mile and, and we, we tried to make it happen. And we I call that automated teaching, not grading, because you're really having that those moments in which you make the student learn happen without you being there, which is kind of a pity. It's also a rewarding part of teaching, but well. Um, okay, so since it's unit tests on steroids, that means that we had to program a lot to make it happen. Uh, that will soon be available. It's not available for everyone yet. And it will be a collection of grading strategies. I like to call them for Python Jupyter Notebooks. It's uh, I, we will see examples here, but it's a collection of preset ways of grading or giving feedback uh, without giving the solution plainly to the student so that they can keep learning. Uh, okay, so now some examples. Uh, I'm not getting into the details right now, but we use different programming languages in the courses. So although our students came from widely different backgrounds, and uh, with widely different amounts of knowledge on how to program. Uh, we used both JavaScript and Python, uh, and it worked out. So here we're, the context is that we're trying to teach someone about geometric transformations using splines, uh, which is a topic that is very relevant to our lab and image processing in general. Um, and then there's this piece of code that the student doesn't have to do. This code is already there. Uh, where, as you can see here, there's a bunch of commands that are exploring what there is in, let me see, they compare the solution uh, to the test uh, image by the student. So we call a function that the student has programmed, we get a test image, and we compare it to what it should be. And then we give feedback according to that. So one option is, okay, there's an error, 
and what you did is not working properly it's probably because of that and here is something that can help you figure out what happened uh, and the other is okay a simple message that says congratulations you passed the sanity check this doesn't mean that you're right but at least you know that you're sort of progressing according to what we expect uh, a bit that seems like a very silly thing but it we found that it really helps the students along the way to know whether they're going on the right path or not uh, then dear this is taking it a notch further this time with python in which we give visual formative feedbacks so in this example we're in the context of learning the wavelet transform uh, and in particular like the polyphase implementation of the hard wavelet transform a very relevant topic for people at tpfl uh, not telling you why uh, but okay the, and here it's almost the same there's a comparison between two arrays and if the comparison doesn't give what what they what we're expecting it to give we we do a bunch of things and this bunch of things will make this happen so the student gets a beware of the image like a, a way to interact with the image we're with some red overlays that signal where the mistakes in their code might be so this is direct visual feedback telling them uh like one of the strongest clues they can get on what what went wrong with their image processing uh code so yeah we're just the maximization of that uh okay now examples of summative feedback uh where you see a bit more the complexity of the grading library and, and what we had to figure out on how to make tests that fail if the student in this case is cheating so in the in this context we're teaching them about deep learning and, and back propagation and we're teaching them what the libraries that they will end up using uh, when they actually do deep learning in industry or in their professional lives will do internally. So we're telling them, okay, don't use those libraries, do it by yourself so that then when, when you're using the libraries, you know what's happening under the hood. Uh, and there's extremely detailed feedback that we can give. So as you can see, the code I show here is basically two text messages that which are the ones that will appear according to the condition so in one case the student has got it wrong so we the notebook can directly display latex and the math they should have done at the, at the very basic level and then say what they should have evaluated on and what they should have submitted as a solution as a result or it can just say okay you did it well again in this nice green box that is very symbolic and very rewarding to see for the students um then yeah again this is going to be available as part of the grading library uh, now here again in the context of the wavelet transform uh, we had a challenge right so we wanted both to teach them how to implement it themselves and how to use the state-of-the-art libraries to do it but it's a competing interest right how would we check if there's no one looking at the code how would we check whether they cheated and just use the library all the time um so there's functions that we developed for that that check basically if they used a, a specific library and if the student has been too smart for their own selves and have used the library it just has this nice little red box that say okay you should not have used the library you, you used it twice so you lost one point um so again i'm gonna be available so okay just to give you a bit the pedagogical context of the course, these are the pedagogical goals that were there for these labs from the 2000s. So it's like having a very clean link between the theory that is taught and the practice of image processing. So really translations between abstract formulas and concrete code as, as often as possible. Then showing applications of real image processing algorithms, giving interactive visual feedback, and providing a setup that the students can then use in the future to implement their own pipelines. Uh, then there's this concept that, that relates to the discussion that was here before, like um, how do you teach someone to program at a pipeline delivering level when they don't know the basics? And our approach has been for 20 years, I think, programming by example. So you give them the scaffolding and you, you give them examples of what works, 
and because you don't want to focus on the programming because that's not what we're really interested in we're interested in the core uh, you give them examples and then they have to imitate those examples and that's how they learn and that often motivates them to later go on to looking at the details of the programming which might not have looked as attractive at the beginning. Then the other way is to implement important IP algorithms and pipelines. So it's like opposite concepts. One is large scale, the other is uh, small scale. So pick down to pixel level to know exactly what an algorithm does, but also know how to put together different uh, image processing pipelines, algorithms together. Uh, and then the last pedagogical goal is the democratization of education. So leveling the field among students who have more and those who have less. Uh, and we do that with open source technology. But we've evolved from 2000, 2020. Now we added things. We didn't drop any, but we added things. Right? You have to be able to work from home, virtually no time limits. That's one a big plus for the students. Instead of having to uh, do a lab in three hours, now they have a week and a day, which is virtually no time limit. Then. Thanks to Noto, no installation hurdles. They just need a browser. Uh, and then industry relevant technologies for, for IP programming. That was not much a focus before, but I think it, it's become a focus now. So to summarize a bit, the we chose this set of technologies. So Jupyter Notebooks, Python, JavaScript, I've mentioned before. And then there's in the middle SOS, which is something that allows Python and JavaScript to talk between them. Uh, yeah. Just a final note on the infrastructure that, that we use now to deploy the course. Uh, so everything happens on Noto, both the development of the labs, the grading of the labs, and the, the students working on the labs. And that way, no one has to be concerned about installation hurdles or an impractical thing for leaving the computer on during the night. Um, so there's an instruction session where there's the source notebook that contains all like the assignment, the solution, the grading criteria. There's a student session in Noto, again, where the student will solve. And to get from one to the other, we use MBGit Puller, which is a very nifty tool that basically tells Noto to get the labs from a public GitHub repository. Then the students, when they're ready, they submit to Moodle. And then Moodle and our own Noto session uh, uh, for grading, talk to each other some way with some degree of automatization provided by custom-made scripts that will hopefully get better in the future with the efforts of the Noto team. Um, okay, and the grading happens there and feedback is generated, which is uploaded to Google. So just to conclude, uh, the feedback from the students, uh, it was it's always very fun to read when it goes well, right? So the best I have encountered, uh, Jado, one one person that really wants to submit even not to get the grades, just to get the feedback. So uh, yeah, and basically overall happiness. A thank you to everyone, the core team, uh, the Noto team, uh, which I guess say that we call the fund, and then uh, two collaborators that contributed to some of the labs. Uh, and I think that's all.